coming in from lunch, but we're going to get started with our keynote portion of uh, the conference. So again, welcome everyone to the 25th anniversary of the Women's Health and Cancer Conference. Um, and so um, I'm just, again, really excited uh, to be here with you today. And also, again, a warm welcome to all of those who are attending over Zoom. We have a few thank yous. So thank you, especially to the Davis Center, to the CMIE teams for arranging all of the um, medical, the continuing education, um, and for our tech support to make this hybrid event possible. And of course, we're really excited to be both in person and to have our um, attendees on Zoom. Importantly, I also want to thank our presenting sponsor, the Victoria Buffum Fund at the UVM Cancer Center for their tremendous support, um, as well as the Eleanor B. Daniels Fund at the UVM Cancer Center, who has generously sponsored meals, Vox Communications for public support. And lastly, all of our exhibitors and many of you who've donated when you registered for today's event. So thank you so much. Um, the philanthropy will help us to continue to create, create um, free, high-quality community education and, and programming. So thank you to everybody. Um, so um, one theme you'll hear today is our commitment to community education, because we know that it empowers patients, providers, and um, public to better health outcomes. And this is a very unique event. And I think that, the, that during this keynote, um, it's really special, and you'll, you'll really kind of get and experience some of that importance. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of the champions of our shared learning, who is uh, Dr. Rick Page, the Dean of the Larner College of Medicine here at the University of Vermont. Dean Page received his medical degree from Duke University and was previously the head of the Division of Cardiology at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington and the chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. In October of 2018, Dean Page um, became the 18th Dean of the Larner College of Medicine, and we are so grateful for his leadership and support and work um, and his support of the work of the Cancer Center. So we really welcome Dean Page. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Santolo Gonzalez. It's really my honor to provide a welcome to all of you on behalf of the UVM Larner College of Medicine to this very special conference and to specifically acknowledge the, uh, the hundreds of people joining us by video as well for the 25th anniversary of UVM Cancer Center's Women's Health and Cancer Conference. In academic medicine, we talk about three missions clinical care, research, and education. But in fact, there's a fourth mission, and that is community service that's provided in a just and equitable manner. I can't think of an event that better fulfills these four missions than this conference. And to be doing that for a quarter century, that's an amazing record of achievement and service to our community. When Dr. Patty O'Brien first created this event, it was one of just a few such uh, conferences bringing together patients, their families, and care providers, all to learn together and from each other. Today, this conference stands out as the national model that's helped change the information landscape for patients, families, and their friends, and has evolved in the time of COVID. Just think, we are doubling the attendance by using Zoom today compared to previous years. This conference provides participants with vital information on research affecting breast cancer and other cancers, on approaches to address rural cancer care disparities, on the use of complementary and integrative approaches to cancer and other important topics. I'm especially looking forward to hearing the keynote address today from our own Dr. Kim Dittis as she addresses care of the whole patient. It's important to note the nature of this conference as a place where both patients and families and those who provide clinical care come together to share experiences in sessions targeted to the needs of patients, families, and the providers. So thank you, Dr. Sintolo Gonzalez and Michelle Macheski for your service as co-chairs of this important event. Thanks also to my colleague, Dr. Randall Holcomb, 
the director of the UVM Cancer Center and chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology, and the inaugural holder of the Juckett Chair in Cancer Research. Dr. Holcomb began his tenure here just 14 months ago. A year ago, I was, I was extolling the wonderful promise of his having joined us, and now we've seen how he's hit the ground running and brought to Vermont and our entire community and region an exceptional breadth of experience as a clinical oncologist, scientist, and leader in cancer care and research, as well as education. He's had a major impact on our college, our university, and the region already, and the best is yet to come. I want to thank everybody at the UVM Cancer Center and the Office of Continuing Medical and Interprofessional Education who've made this conference a reality. I'd also like to express my deep gratitude to the Courtney and Victoria Buffum Family Foundation, whose gener generosity in creating the Patty O'Brien MD Women's Health and Cancer Fund has secured support for this conference in perpetuity. Just think, 24, 25 years from now, some other dean, I'm afraid it won't be me, but some other dean will be thanking the foundation for the wisdom and the foresight and the vision of creating this important conference. Finally, I want to welcome and thank all of the patients, families, and healthcare providers who are here today. Your commitment will alter the course of cancer in our community and beyond. So again, it's my great pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to learning with you. And it's now my pleasure to introduce conference co-chair, Michelle Macheski. Michelle is a physician assistant here at the University of Vermont Medical Center. She works in surgical oncology and runs their high-risk uh, breast cancer clinic, where she sees women who are at high risk for breast cancer, including those with family history of breast cancer, those with genetic mutation, and those who have previously had cancer. Please join me in welcoming conference co-chair, Michelle Macheski. Thank you, Dean Page. It is my honor to, I'm gonna try not to cry, to um, introduce you to a dear friend and mentor, Dr. Patricia O'Brien, who founded the Women's Health and Cancer Conference 25 years ago. We invited Patty to share a story of beginning this conference and learn so much more through her wisdom, her strength, and her vulnerability. In many ways, this community reflects I, the identities that Patty holds, clinician, mother, patient, and community member. I think all of us that know Patty can agree she's a remarkable woman. As Dr. Dittis said the other day, she's quite a gem. Whether you are one of her patients or a colleague or even able to say that she was a friend, we are all that much better for having her in our lives. She has inspired us, she's cheered us on, and taught each one of us. We can't thank her enough, but what we can do is carry on with her spirit of volunteering and giving back to the community in whatever way possible. So please enjoy. We wanted to give women power, we wanted to give women knowledge, and we wanted to give women each other. Hi, I'm Patty O'Brien. I was one of the original volunteers that helped get the Women's Health and Cancer Conference set up. We wanted to create a very safe environment for women to come in and get the information they needed so that they could make their own treatment decisions. Hi Muss was the director of the Vermont Cancer Center at that time, and he was taking care of a wonderful woman, Victoria Buffum, and she wanted to set up an endowment that would support people going through cancer therapy there was also a very interesting research study that was published at that time that said women with advanced metastatic cancer 
who participated in structured support groups lived longer than women who didn't participate in support groups. At that same time, I personally was diagnosed with a locally advanced breast cancer. So I was like, hey, I'm in this study. I want to live longer. So I joined the research study. I had been a primary care physician before my diagnosis, and I was taking a year off from my clinical practice to get my treatment. And I started running informal classes for women, talking to them about their choices in therapy. So I went to Dr. Muss. We need to have a cancer conference here that serves women with cancer. Dr. Musk said, okay, we'll organize a conference. Over 600 people showed up and we were off and running. And so the conference was always designed to be fun. Gotta have music, gotta have food, gotta have people dancing around and lots of hugs. So I told you about Victoria Buffum. She set up the endowment to help people with cancer. Her brother, Tom Gauntlet, worked on that board for years, making sure that Vicky's wishes were fulfilled. Vicky had also set up the Courtney and Victoria Buffum family endowment, which was also set to fund another set of community projects. This year, they decided to very generously give a $1 million endowment to keep this conference going into perpetuity, which means that all of you here today will be able to go to a conference a year from now, five years from now, to get the best information so that you can continue to make good choices about your care. So I wanna to thank Tom and Melissa Gauntlet for their work with the foundation in honor of Victoria Buffum and her daughter Courtney, because this endowment is going to really help continue to give top-notch education and care. Beyond the endowment, it's all the volunteers that make this conference possible. But I'm gonna tell you about one superstar. Her name is Gail Wixon. Many of you may know Gail because she was so active in the cancer community. She did radio ads talking about, go get your screening. Don't be afraid of mammograms. Every time she came into clinic, she always had jokes for all of us. She always made us laugh and she always gave us hugs. I hope that all of you, wherever you are in your cancer journey, are feeling a welcome part of this community. And we all need to take what we need from this community, but we can also give back to the community. And just like what we need may be different, what we can give may be different. I'm very excited about the future of this conference. This conference was like my baby and I was raising children and I was building a conference. And I've now moved to California. I'm not gonna be here um, working on this conference during the next 25 years, but I'm very excited about what you all are gonna do with it. Those of you who are newly diagnosed, those of you who are long-term survivors, this will go in the direction you make it go. And it will be here to serve you and you to serve the cancer community around you. It was a very personal journey that I was going through and I tried to share my journey and my needs with other women. And I grew because so many women told me their stories. 
I always go back to take it one day at a time, take it one deep breath at a time, and move through it. When I was going through my own experience with cancer, I was told I might have only five years to raise my children, and that was incredibly scary because my kids were young. I was afraid I wasn't gonna get my kids through elementary school, and then could I get them through high school, and then could I get them through college. I, my kids are now adults, and now I get to be a grandmother. I got to retire, and now my goal is to keep up with my grandchildren. They were my motivation to keep being part of another study, to keep doing treatments. I wanted to live to raise my children, and I feel incredibly lucky that I got that. So I just want to thank everybody who helped me get through my journey, who helped me decide what experimental care I wanted, who would kind of pat me on the shoulder when I needed some help, who um, would see me crying and would give me a hug in the chemo room. A lot of people got me through this and I can't thank them enough because I'm here and I get to be with my grandchildren. Thank you. We have such an appreciation for Patty. And I just want to acknowledge what a special day it is here to be together, celebrating the milestone in the 25th anniversary of this conference. As Patty mentioned, we couldn't imagine this event without so many volunteers and our amazing staff. I need to call some of you out because you've done a yeoman's job just to get this conference off the ground this year. Thank you to Rachel Narkowitz, Terry Caron, Michelle Morin, Kate Strautmeyer, our events crew, speakers, and so many others for making this possible and especially to our co-chairs, Jessica Santola Gonzalez and Michelle Macheski for leading us this year. Over the past 25 years, so much has changed and so much has stayed the same. We value support, mutual learning, and the important role that the Cancer Center can play in connecting people to research clinical care and helping to develop the next generation of cancer doctors. Most importantly, as Dean Page commented on, serving our community is at the heart of our purpose. As you heard, this conference is going to continue to be a community resource. The Courtney and Victoria Buffum Family Foundation have generously given $1 million to endow this conference and created as the new Patty O'Brien MD Women's Health and Cancer Fund. <clears throat> I wanna thank all of the board members uh, for their generosity in making this happen. And particularly wanna call out those who were able to attend today, Mary Alice McKenzie, Melissa Gauntlet and Tom Gauntlet. Let's give them a round of applause. I'd like to acknowledge the longstanding support of the UVM Cancer Center from the, from the Buffum family, and really need to comment on the value of endowing this community asset for patients, providers, caretakers, and family members. I have the honor now of introducing our keynote speaker, Kim Dittis, MD and PhD. She's an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont and a member of the UVM Cancer Center. She's a medical oncologist with a background in nutrition and lifestyle change. She's medical director of supportive services at UVM Cancer Center where she promotes programs that mitigate or improve side effects related to cancer and cancer treatment. Her research interests broadly encompass cancer survivor issues. In particular, she's interested in developing interventions that promote healthy food choice and exercise for patients. She's gonna to talk to us today about 
treating the patient as the whole patient. Kim Dittis, happy to have you with us. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Holcomb. And I also wanna thank Patty O'Brien, who has been my mentor, my supporter, and she has always put um, the needs of individuals with cancer first. So I really need to thank her. All right, so I um, uh, like this quote by um, Hippocrates and, oh, yep, I'm going backwards. Cause is that okay? All right, here we go. Here's the start of, of my talk. It, um, I guess it was just a little bit of out, of out of order. So I am gonna be talking today about moving from treating cancer to treating the whole person. And I think it's important to acknowledge the diversity in this crowd. So there are individuals who are healthcare providers. There are individuals who maybe were recently diagnosed um, with cancer. And there are individuals who may have um, had a cancer diagnosis um, many years ago. So it's a very broad audience. So I'm really hoping um, to, uh, make this important topic uh, hit home for all the multiple audiences in this conference. So I hope to encourage healthcare providers who are here to consider interventions that focus on more than just the cancer and on interventions that potentially improve cancer treatment. And for those of you who have a cancer diagnosis, I'm hoping to encourage you um, to take an active role in your cancer um, journey. And cancer is a journey. And I didn't talk to Patty. I had no idea that she was going to make that analogy with a journey. It's a, it's a logical one. But cancer is an unexpected journey, but also probably an unwelcome um, journey for um, uh, everybody. And this journey seems to have selected you. Um, uh, nobody goes uh, seeking this particular journey. And once you're on that journey, you don't have many choices among the activities on this trip. And it certainly is no vacation. And you may feel lost, even though there is a map, at least the healthcare providers uh, have a good idea of what that map uh, might look like on the journey, but you might not feel um, that um, there is a, a straight line forward. So I think it's important to acknowledge both for um, individuals with cancer and also individuals treating um, uh, ind individuals who have cancer, that really the object of medical care should not really be the disease itself, but the person who should be treated as a whole and not as an organ in which this disorder appears. And this is a quote from Hippocrates, obviously from centuries ago. But far from healing, feeling whole when you have a cancer diagnosis, an individual who has a cancer diagnosis may feel more fragmented than ever. And so where do you start on this journey? How do you start to bring things um, together a little bit? So um, uh, how do you take back some of that control? So when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So one way that you can start to do that is to kind of reconnect that body and brain. Once you have a, a cancer diagnosis, it feels like you are on a runaway train. Your brain is going miles a minute. And how do you slow down and get control of that again? I think it's really important to give yourself permission to be sad, to be tearful, to be angry, to be scared, or fill in the blank with whatever feelings that you're having um, at the time. They're real feelings, and you need to um, uh, uh, give yourself permission to have them. And it's important to seek help. So help from healthcare providers, but also help from family, whatever, however you define family, and friends, and as well as counselors and support groups. And I want to mention a little bit of um, where the University of Vermont Cancer Center um, can help. We have counselors available that are trained to deal with the specific concerns that individuals with cancer have. We have social workers that can help you along that journey, both in terms of um, uh, helping with financial issues, connecting you to services. We have support groups so that individuals can connect with individuals who have been on that same journey and maybe have come out the other end. 
we have a really unique program, uh, our child life specialist, um, who helps individuals who have young children or even older children to help to explain the process of cancer to them, because that can be a very, very trying time, obviously for the person, but then they have um, family that they're concerned about as well. And then cancer and a cancer diagnosis can really be an existential crisis. And um, we have a chaplaincy uh, program, non-denominational, that can help um, with um, those feelings that might come up. So then how do you then deal with the impacts of cancer and cancer therapy? And I want to point out that we'd like to emphasize the best of um, both worlds. So that's kind of how I define integrative medicine as the best of um, two worlds. So it's the best of conventional medicine integrated with the best of complementary approaches that work together simultaneously and ideally synergistically so that they help each other to support health and healing. So conventional interventions, those are the things that you typically think of, surgery, radiation, infusional therapies, medications for the side effects related to cancer treatment, and also rehab therapies and physical therapy to help with range of motion and other things that might be um, uh, uh, changed in your body as a result of your cancer um, treatment. And if you attended this morning's conference uh, sessions, you heard about really new and exciting um, uh, ways that uh, it, cancer can be treated like CAR T uh, cell therapy. And then there's the complementary um, modalities, mind-body practices, mindfulness, counseling, support groups, acupuncture, um, uh, massage, and other uh, movement interventions. And there are many complementary modalities that really work in terms of cancer. And actually, that's where a lot of the research has been done with complementary medicines. So we know that acupuncture can really help with pain. Uh, cancer-related pain and other pain. It helps with hot flashes. It helps with dry mouth for individuals who have had uh, uh, radiation um, for head and neck issues. It helps with nausea and vomiting. Similarly, massage helps with pain, but also it helps with anxiety and uh, helps with peripheral neuropathy, a um, late and lingering um, side effect of our cancer um, therapies. And it improves sleep. And mindfulness helps to deal with anxiety, stress, and also um, improve sleep. And we have these modalities um, uh, in, within the University of Vermont Cancer Center. Um, the um, acupuncture um, uh, went away during COVID, but it's starting to come back and probably next week will be available for individuals who are admitted to the hospital um, on uh, Miller 5 at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Massage is back, um, both in the infusional area and um, on um, Miller 5. So some of you might be thinking about other medications as well to think about expanding um, uh, how you're uh, going to treat your cancer. So what about expanding your team? And so I wanna talk just briefly about naturopathic physicians and integrative medicine physicians that we work at, at, with at the University of Vermont um, Medical Center. And so they have been incredibly helpful for doing several things, but they encourage individuals to um, uh, seek out conventional um, treatment. They're really great at correcting misunderstandings that might be found on the internet. And heaven knows there's a lot of information on the internet about um, cancer and many other things. They're really great at improving symptom control and picking out interventions that aren't going to interfere with how well your conventional um, uh, treatments might work. And they're really great at individualizing risk reduction strategies, addressing other health issues, and including anxiety and depression. Um, and the ones that we work with in particular are um, Drs. Amy Littlefield, Dr. Hill, and Dr. Anemone Fresh at the Vermont Wellness Medi uh, Medicine and Integrative Oncology in Middlebury, and also Dr. Andrea Fassati, who's here in the Burlington area at Apple Tree Bay. So I wanna take just a bit of a jump and talk a little bit more about integrative health and introduce um, the Osher Center for Integrative Health at the University of Vermont. And this has been on the news because we just, the University of Vermont just recently obtained funding from the Bernard Osher um, Foundation to set up a center for integrative health at the University of uh, Vermont. And this is really exciting because it's gonna give us opportunities to 
uh, communicate um, to learners about integrative um, options. So we are working um, with education at the whole range of, of learners at the University of Vermont. So individuals who are in nursing programs, who are in physical therapy programs, social work programs, and um, medical students as well. And then our goal also is to begin to um, uh, really focus on research, some about how these uh, interventions might help, but also research related to how we can provide these interventions in a way that reaches more people in a cost-effective manner and um, uh, evaluate the effectiveness um, more broadly that way. And also include clinical um, uh, uh, interventions um, because we know that they're valuable. And I think the last one is key, and that's um, to focus on policy because it, unless we can have a payment structure that helps to pay for complementary and integrative um, uh, interventions, it's going to be really difficult for that to be available for the broad population. And I just want to point out one person, Kara Feldman Hunt, who is our associate director of the Osher Center, and she has been our champion for integrative oncology and bringing integrative um, medicine here to um, the University of Vermont in the medical center and had played a significant role, she and um, uh, Provost uh, Patty Prelock, at bringing the Osher Center here. And this is really, really exciting and just happened this summer. All right, so um, uh, then what can you do yourself um, when you are starting down this process of um, being treated for cancer and are in the middle of initial therapies? It's important to take care of yourself as well. So one way to do that is to connect. So to connect with the healthcare team. I think it's important to communicate to your healthcare care providers, your physicians and the um, in nurses in the infusion area, the other primary um, oncology uh, nurses, the social workers, the counselors about how you're doing. And it's important to let us know about if you, uh, what other um, interventions you're using, um, whether it's supplements or uh, other modalities. But it's also important to connect with your home care team. Often when someone has a cancer diagnosis, people come out of the woodwork to help. And it's okay to accept help from other individuals. And then it's also important to move. And I'm not talking about training for a marathon, but we know that individuals who move, even if it feels like it's slow motion during their initial cancer um, treatments, that they feel better, do better, and can handle their um, uh, cancer interventions better. And yoga is a nice way to do that because that brings in some movements and some strength training, but also some mindfulness um, and breath work as well. So that's another way um, to help take care of yourself. And eat well, you know, within the context of how you're feeling. Our, our infusional therapies often change people's taste buds. And so the foods that you once really preferred, you might not prefer so well. And sometimes you're just not hungry. Sometimes you're nauseous. So eating well within the context of acknowledge, acknowledging what you need. And I think there's some really interesting and exciting information about our food choices and how, um, our, uh, how we do with our cancers. So we know um, that a plant-forward, plant-focused diet actually helps our immune therapies work better. So individuals who focus on uh, a plant-based diet, sometimes their cancer responds better um, to um, their immunotherapy um, treatments. So that's really exciting. And then always the fourth pillar of health is um, sleep. So prioritizing sleep, which is, of course, difficult in this um, uh, situation because you might be getting medications that hype you up and like steroids that um, uh, are, make it difficult to sleep. Or you might have worry um, that's um, uh, going around in your head a mile a minute and it makes it difficult to sleep as well. So prioritizing sleep and taking naps and taking rests during um, the day. So for some individuals, this journey is really hectic at the beginning, and then it starts to slow down and um, potentially, oh, oh, I'm going backwards, potentially um, uh, end, even though it doesn't really quite ever really end um, for individuals who have had cancer. It just sort of moves more to the back of their brain. 
But for others, it's an ongoing journey. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that healing is always possible, even when cure is not. And for those individuals whose journey might be continuing, and for those who care for them, I really encourage you to attend Dr. Burns' talk this afternoon, talking about what matters most, uh, a person-centered goals of care discussions. So another set of individuals, their, their cancer journey is slowing down. Um, they are, it's less at the forefront of their mind. They're involved with it less, but there's still light and lingering impacts of cancer and our treatments. There's fatigue, the most common um, side effect and late and lingering impact of our cancer um, uh, journey. And that affects about 75% of individuals. Related to that is sleep problems. Some of the new medications you might be on for uh, maintenance um, might interfere with your sleep. Sometimes individuals develop numbness and tingling, peripheral neuropathy in their fingers and toes as a result of some of our treatments, and that can take a good long time um, to um, resolve. And we, um, thankfully, at the University of Vermont Medical Center, have a neurologist whose specialty is um, cancer-related um, peripheral neuropathy, Dr. Kolb. And we may have uh, shoved some individuals right into menopause really abruptly, and there are menopausal symptoms that come with that. And then the whole process is associated with some loss of strength and endurance. And then there's this sort of sense of now what? After you finished your initial um, treatment, now what? And actually, that was the um, uh, title of a talk um, earlier um, uh, today, um, because that can be a time that the anxiety just gets ramped up again, because you're not seeing someone all of the time, and um, uh, you need to uh, uh, go um, forward with your life, but how do you do that? So hopefully some of you attended that talk. And I think it's also important at this point to point out that integrative therapies really help with all of those um, issues above. And it's important as well to not forget about the integrative interventions and um, programs that might be in your community, because not everybody lives close to Burlington. Um, some people live distant from Burlington, or some individuals don't necessarily want to be, keep coming um, to the hospital. And so um, I will uh, uh, point this out again at the end, but there's a booth um, in uh, uh, down the hall uh, related to the Osher Center where we have um, um, some uh, cards about um, how to connect with individuals possibly in your community as well. So I'm going to bring back and circle back to those pillars of health again, um, uh, because they remain important as we move beyond um, uh, the initial um, journey of cancer. And those again are connecting and moving and eating well and um, sleeping. So connecting can help us um, uh, decrease the risk of uh, cancer recurrence. It increases longevity. And the, there was an interesting study about um, the numbers of social connections individuals have, and those with um, uh, more feel, who felt more connected actually had a lower risk of their cancer come back. I think it's really important to point out that it's not necessarily the number of those connections for those of us who are introverts like myself. It's feeling um, connected so, to individuals it's because you can also feel alone in a crowd. Um, so it's not necessarily um, the total number. And these connections can also help improve, with, improve immune function and improve mental health. And one of the reasons that I got into the whole supportive um, aspect of cancer was um, the data that came out in 2005 about the fact that individuals with breast cancer who moved more, who um, participated in more physical activity, actually had a lower chance of their breast cancer coming back. Well, we know that that's true for cancers beyond um, breast cancer at this, this point. So moving is um, uh, really exciting and critically important. But it also decreases the risk of chronic health issues. And I think it's important to put someone's cancer diagnosis into perspective. So someone who has an early stage breast cancer, this is just one example, someone with an early stage breast cancer, they're more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than they are to die of their breast cancer. And so it's important to think about those other chronic health problems and what your family history um, might um, be, point, what chronic disease that might be um, uh, pointing you towards. 
And then eating well. We know that a healthy diet pattern is associated with decreased risk of recurrence of women's cancers, probably men's cancers as well. But um, this was just an interesting um, study that focused on women's cancers. And this doesn't have to be complicated, even though it feels like the media complicates what foods we should be putting in our mouth. It needs to be a minimally processed, plant-based diet. And it's just as simple as that. Um, so when you look down on your plate, it needs to be mostly veg, mostly vegetables. And um, meat is okay, probably not hot dogs and bologna, however. Um, so the, the processing piece is important because you could also have a vegetarian diet that's very processed and not going to be healthy for you either. So that minimally processed um, piece is important. So whole grains and whole vegetables and things that are not like peas, but then they look like something extruded that you don't even know. They don't look like peas anymore. So it's important to, um, to have the um, uh, uh, unprocessed options. And then sleep. Sleep improves your physical and emotional functioning, and inadequate sleep may be associated with increased risk of recurrence as well. Now, these, these all seem sort of separate. You, you need to, do, you need to um, eat well, you need to connect, you need to move, you need to sleep, but they all build on each other. So eating well does all the things that we um, talked about, but it also creates a healthier gut microbiome, which can help with other chronic diseases. It fuels movement and it improves um, mental health. There's really interesting um, studies going on uh, about um, how our food choices can impact um, mental health. And there's a whole field growing on nutritional psychiatry. And actually there's going to be a, har a nutritional psychiatrist from Harvard who's going to be talking at our um, Northern New England Oncology um, Conference, which is coming up uh, the end of October. So I think that's really exciting how these can um, uh, influence each other. Similarly, for moving, obviously it improves, it improves strength and cardiac function, but it also helps with weight maintenance. It also changes what, you, what foods you often select to eat, and it improves mental health and cognitive function as well. People who exercise seem to do better on cognitive tests and helps you sleep. Connecting supports healthy food choices and exercise. So we know that the social um, support around you is, uh, is critically important for whether you're going to be able to um, pick up an exercise program and stick with it or to make um, uh, changes in your diet. It also decreases anxiety and depression and increases quality of life. And sleep helps you make better choices. Who can make good choices it, when they're very, very um, tired? So it's really important to help make better choices, perhaps about um, eating well and moving. It provides um, energy to move because you um, aren't gonna be moving too fast if you are sleep deprived. It decreases hunger. So it decreases some of the um, uh, body's hormones that contribute to um, hunger. And it helps you to better able challenges. So I want to conclude with some ways that um, the University of Vermont Cancer Center has of helping with these four pillars of um, health. So some ways to connect our um, counselors. And I mentioned these counselors before, but here they are, um, the three counselors um, that we have at the University of Vermont Medical Center who have specific training in dealing with individuals who have cancer and some of the challenges. And there's some group um, work um, counseling that Dr. Luria does as well. And then we have a number of support groups, the Breast Cancer Connection Group, uh, there's a support group for gynecologic cancers, so some for specific female cancers, but there's support groups for others as well. And we have uh, Living with Advanced Cancer um, uh, group, so for individuals with um, uh, stage four cancer, and we're collaborating with, the, with Central Vermont Medical Center um, to, um, uh, for that one. And that's one of the silver linings of of COVID has been our ability to use Zoom. So we can um, uh, tap into um, expertise uh, from the Central Vermont um, uh, uh, Medical Center to help us with these support groups. And then there's other um, support groups as well. And then we have um, mindfulness opportunities um, uh, to help um, uh, deal with stress and um, uh, those are available uh, periodically as well. And then moving, and I think 
are one of my most exciting um, uh, projects that I've worked on um, has been our Steps to Wellness program. And I have to say, we would not have steps, our Steps to Wellness exercise intervention without Patty O'Brien. She um, was critical in making this happen. So what Steps to Wellness is, is our, um, uh, our uh, supervised um, exercise intervention for individuals with cancer. And so we provide interventions for improving aerobic capacity, but also strength and also balance because we um, uh, found out early on that individuals who've had certain chemotherapies have some challenges um, to their um, balance. And so the picture there is of uh, Rebecca Reynolds. She's our exercise um, trainer, and she is one of the most intrepid individuals I've ever met. And she's been with us for 10 years, and I'm sure many of you um, uh, know her. But COVID hit, um, and everything shut down. And by June, she had um, a Zoom platform set up so that we could continue uh, Steps to Wellness virtually. And we're still doing that. We are now back in person at the O'Brien Center. We used to be at Attili Drive. We're at the O'Brien Center. But we've continued the Zoom um, options as well because we've been able to reach so many more individuals who don't live close to um, Burlington or maybe prefer not to come in person. So that has been an um, option. Uh, awesome. So we also have um, yoga um, that is provided um, virtually at this point. And I saw down the hall that um, you can participate in some uh, uh, trying out yoga if you're interested. And yoga is great for strength and balance in particular, but also with connection and mindfulness, because that's really key to yoga as well is um, the breath work. And then there's the eating well part. So we have a registered dietitian at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, her name is Jen May, and she works primarily with individuals who have challenges getting enough to eat, uh, who have challenges with malnutrition. And then we have um, health coaches like Christy Grover and Emily Coleman, who they're our, our behavior change experts. And they help individuals um, who are interested in making those lifestyle change in terms of wanting to eat better to help um, prevent cancer from coming back and just overall feeling better. They can do the same thing for helping individuals to move um, as well. And then um, right before um, COVID hit, we had started some culinary programs um, with the chef at the University of Vermont Medical Center. And um, hopefully we will bring that back very soon because that was really exciting because you can have all the healthy food you want in your refrigerator, but unless you know how to make it and um, do it in a way that is um, culturally appropriate appropriate, maybe timely appropriate uh, as well, and um, food that your family enjoys. Um, you can have a bunch of vegetables rotting in your refrigerator. So knowing how to use it is important. And then you can't get much more down to really healthy eating than to grow it yourself. And so there, um, we had a gardening um, uh, offering this summer. So some individuals who have, who had cancer participated in a, um, I think it was 12 weeks as well, gardening um, intervention where um, individuals went to their home, but also um, they um, grew vegetables on the rooftop um, garden area at the University of Vermont Medical Center. So lots of options and other options um, um, uh, in community areas as well. And so that's a whole lot of information. And I don't want that to feel overwhelming um, to anybody because you don't have to do all of that. Everything adds together and it's like... I hate to use the term gateway drug, but if you just use, if you just start with one, one small change that resonates with you, that just um, bursts wide open the opportunities um, for uh, uh, doing more and more lifestyle interventions to help you feel better. So start with one change that resonates with you. Start really, really small. There's a really interesting book um, by a uh, professor at um, uh, Stanford called Tiny Habits, and he has studied this in depth, how to um, uh, start really, really small and in what situations do you add these habits so that you can make those habits um, uh, long lasting. And then change will grow from there. So I want to, um, to point out that there's a booth down the hall um, that has information about our supportive services, has in information about the Osher Center. Um, so there's a booth at the conference. And then there's the University of Vermont Cancer Center websites and the Osher website. 
And just this year, we um, started a newsletter for individuals who, um, who have cancer. So some of you have probably received that. And we've been, um, uh, hope, our goal is to provide it at least three times a year. So this newsletter provides information about connecting to these resources and some other specialty topics as well. So that has been um, really exciting. So I hope you've come away with this idea that it's important to consider more than just the disease and um, thinking about treating the whole uh, person. And so thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Sorry, thank you. I think just like we, like every, hopefully I'm very into that talk. So I almost forgot that I was coming up here. That was excellent, Dr. Dittis. Thank you so much. And the main reason I am up here is to try to help people transition out of this talk into the afternoon session, because I obviously had trouble myself with that. Um, so afternoon session begins at 1250. Um, so we have a little bit of time. Um, and just a reminder that on the back of your name tag, you will see a list of the lectures that you had selected at registration, um, along with the room location as a quick reference. Obviously, you're not beholden to that, but just to kind of help you figure out where you want to go. The next lecture that will be in this room will be Screening Guidelines 101, Lung, Colorectal, and Gynecologic Cancers. And then down the hall will be How to Build Your Integrative Care Team, um, which I think will be very popular after this talk. And that will be in the Levesque, um Ballroom. So um, we still have some great programming for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you again so much, Dr. Dittis. That was an excellent talk. <laughs>